Right, we should be going live. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I'm Hilton Supra. I'll be moderating the panel today on how to scale up and venture capital accelerators and how networks are aiding the growth to the business startup ecosystem. ecosystem. Um, this is a panel session part of the Open Business Cities ABC Open Business Council Summit two-day uh, event. And I'm really, really proud today to have uh, a fantastic panel joining me um, from all over the world. We were just been talking about where we are. So we've got William, William, um, William Bao, who's currently in Taipei. We've got Aaron Sharma, who's currently in KL, in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia. We've got Charlie Hu, is, who is in uh, Shanghai. And we've got John Sharp, who's in Singapore. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, I'm very, very privileged to have such an esteemed panel with us today. So I'll just start with William. Um, William Bauer is the general partner of SOSV. Um, it's an accelerator VC and the number three, the most active venture capital investor in the world, according to PitchBook, um, with about you know just under nine hundred billion under dollars under management. As managing director in China Accelerator, the first accelerator in Asia, uh, the only active accelerator to have a unicorn amongst them which is BitMEX, which was, I think, in 2015. He's also founder and managing director of Mox, the mobile-only accelerator, providing startups with free user acquisition, helping the portfolio scale to about 102 million monthly active users with no uh, marketing spend, which is a great achievement. William joined SOSC from Singtel in, in, in of eight ventures, where he was the founding managing director investing in Greater China. Prior to that, William was a partner at SoftBank China and India Holdings, a VC backed by SoftBank and Cisco, leading investments in China and Southeast Asia. Now, William started his career in equity research, most recently with Deutsche Bank, where he was a top-ranked analyst for Asia Internet and top tech media and telco, and worked in IPO for Alibaba, Kingsoft, Elong, which is an Expedia China um, uh, company, One Mobile, Rediff, and Nukeri. And then we've got Aaron Sharma, who's the general partner and scale up of Malaysia, who's an entrepreneur and has a great experience in technology, and digital media and retail. And he founded a company called Touristly in 2015, uh, 2015, I think, Aaron, and you sold it to AirAsia in 2017, which was re later rebranded as Vidi and has now become AirAsia.com, where he remains as a non-executive board member. And you currently serve as general partner in the Scale Up Malaysia, which is a very important part of today's uh, panel, accelerating and looking at startups to build in, to the next level in Malaysia. And you've basically, you're investing and scaling 50 companies in the next three years. And previously in 2009, prior to the pandemic, you were head of the digital development at Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, MDEC, where we were represented by Serena, who was the CEO of that yesterday, to help develop and the blueprint for the national digital economy policy of Malaysia. I mean, you're obviously very passionate about tech, uh, tech and the cool stuff that it brings, and therefore you're you know, in the ideal place. Then we've got Charlie Hugh, who's the managing partner of Carbon Blue, who's basically uh, looking at Web3 de decentralized technology platforms and applications and looking at um, the current ecosystems of Polkadot and Web3. He's an expert in building communities and is very technology focused and technology driven and, and in terms of the growth marketing in that space. And he's used lots of tools like hackathons and events, et cetera, in order to bring out the content for, um, for the community that he works with. Is a member of the World Economic Forum, Global a Shaper Beijing Hub, an organization of TEDx Hang, uh, Hangzhou, an organizer of ThingsCon, which is in Shanghai, and is an alumni of Google Launchpad in Amsterdam, because you know you spent some time there. And Google Design Sprint China, alumni at Aspire Academy, Harvard a Leadership Program. So you're well traveled, well educated, and uh, well versed in technology on a global perspective. Then we got John Sharp, who is a partner of Hatcher, which is a fantastic organization. Um, he's currently sitting in Singapore. He's a partner of Hatcher Plus, which is a leading data-driven venture capital investment firm. 
And John has extensive commercial experience and senior management level, having, having been the chief executive of Athenium Wing, which is, and also the managing director for World Space and, and now CEO of uh, Hatcher, the precursor company to Hatcher Plus. I mean, he's a very tenacious and uh, driven executive with a long standing board level and C level experience within high growth companies. And John also brings a strong history of capital raising from an extensive network of investors globally. Now, as chairman and CEO of Cyber, cyber Security Pioneer at Ethereum, which actually was acquired, I think, in 2010 by Siren, you co authored um, three US patents in terms and, and sold um, uh, cybersecurity solutions to some of the largest organizations in the world. Um, you know, you worked with British Telecom, Comcast, Google, McAfee, Microsoft, Simtech, Telstra. I mean, the list goes on. As CTO of uh, Hatcher Plus, Doc Doc, Hearable, and Thought River, John has designed and developed several highly innovative technology platforms using really cutting edge approaches to data processing user interfaces design and workflow optimization. You blog a lot. I see a lot of the work that you're doing. You can't fly at the moment like all of us because you spend a lot of time speaking at a lot of great events um, on ventures globally, particularly focusing on not only your experience, but also focusing on ESG. So thank you very much, gentlemen, um, for joining us. I'd like to start with William. Um, if you could just give us a few uh, a few minutes, two or three minutes of what you're working on at this present time and what your goals are to uh, in the next next few months as we come out of COVID. Yeah, sure. So um, I think we're we're uh, uh, in a unique spot because um, I'm I'm in Taipei right now. We have our office here for Mox, and then. Um, uh, we're, we're also, most of our people are in Shanghai. So we've been uh, in the office in Shanghai since early March of last year, uh, and our Taiwan office never closed. Um, but most of our portfolio companies are, are across Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and in, especially in uh, India, where we've done uh, 54 investments over the last two years. Uh, Southeast Asia, we've done about 25 investments, 30 investments over the last two years. Uh, so um, while we, we've had a relatively normal life, our portfolio is going through uh, some uh, really bad uh, times, especially this last two weeks in, in India, Pakistan, where like um, half of our teams are getting taken out, right? Uh, we've got six, um, six CEOs that got COVID in the last two weeks. Uh, so uh, it's pretty, pretty tough. Um, so I, I'd say the, um, but for us, I mean, you know, the, uh, on the flip side, um, you know, COVID has been uh, quite positive in that we are very active in consumer internet. Um, and we're trying to change the game. Uh, so there's this uh, sort of trend of everybody hating on big internet, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, you know, big internet taking over the world. Um, so we've been um, uh, created mocks to kind of, uh, as an accelerator, uh, to take advantage of uh, the backlash against big internet. Um, so as opposed to many VCs who invest in companies that are there to disrupt traditional industry, we're investing in deep tech and hard tech, and we actually partner with big industry. Um, and one of the big challenges for you know large companies from shopping malls to TV stations to telcos to handset brands uh, is that big internet is eating their lunch. Um, so with Mox, what we've been, done is partner uh, with those large corporates and trade free advertising. Uh, for our portfolio companies in return for revenue share. Uh, so I didn't come up with this model. It's basically the Xiaomi model, right? Uh, I, I just took it out of China. Uh, and instead of, you know, giving away free handsets, we're basically uh, going to uh, uh, going to partners. Um, and so, uh, and, and say, hey, listen, you know, you don't have an internet business. Uh, you've tried three times and failed. Uh, you're under huge pressure. Uh, so why don't we partner? So I think one of the important things with scaling up is how do you do that without giving your entire company away? Uh, right now in consumer internet, almost no VCs are investing in it because you have to spend a dollar to make uh, 50 cents. So what we do is we get the user for free, then we make the 50 cents and then we share 17 back to whoever gave us the user on a rev share basis. Uh, so for accelerators and for scaling up, it's not just about fundraising. Fundraising is very, very important, um, but it's, it's about how we as you know, partners um, with the startups that we invested, especially at the early stage where accelerators um, are, are, are really important, uh, what can we do? 
uh, to help those companies get to where we're going. And so, you know, my check size is really small. We're investing 150, 200K. Um, why would people, uh, you know, take our money? Uh, and, and the reason is that, um, you know, we can provide that, that, that scale and that growth uh, without spending cash. Uh, and so, um, uh, this did not work for the first four years. It took us four years to get to 6 million users. Uh, but uh, from mid-2019 to August 2020, we went from 6 million monthly active users to 50 million monthly active users. And just from last August to this February, we went from 50 to 102 million monthly active users for our portfolio. And that's pretty much with a customer acquisition cost of, of zero. And that's we're just focused on trying to handle that growth now and, and, and guide our companies through this really tough time. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, Aaron, um, in, in Kuala Lumpur, give me a little, a little bit of an insight into where you are at this present time going forward with your, 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 your vision um, and how, how, how things are, are going from your side. Sure thing. Uh, thanks, Hilton. So basically, we are, we're Accelerator Program is based in Malaysia. And I guess from the name, you'd assume that we focus primarily on Malaysian companies. Um, we started in 2019 at a point where some of us were in the founding partnership team, the six of us were kind of an interesting crossroads and we were either exiting our businesses or looking for new things we could do together. Uh, the six of us come from various backgrounds. Um, some of them, uh, Doc Siva and Renu used to run a, and still do actually run a, a coaching and training program in Malaysia. They work with the government a lot, a lot to do these programs. Um, we have another partner called Zilia who's, uh, who was with Cradle Fund at the time. And then there's Chandni, Andre, and I, who are also entrepreneurs who had recently sold our businesses and were looking for something meaningful to do. We saw a gap in the Malaysian ecosystem because we're, we're big believers in Southeast Asia as a investment block. Uh, China is something everybody talks about. It's huge. It's you know a billion people. India is also another big market, but Southeast Asia is a bit of a different kind of animal because of how uh, disparate and how kind of uh, small the different countries are. And to build like a regional play is kind of challenging. And we saw an opportunity in helping Malaysian companies kind of scale and get to that point. Um, we, we are a firm believer in Malaysian entrepreneurs. And so we came together to create Scale Up Malaysia Accelerator in 2019. So we did our first cohort then. Uh, and uh, an interesting thing happened in 2020. Uh, the pandemic struck. And then we were forced to make a decision as to whether or not we're going to continue the cohort, invest in the companies. And thankfully, about a year ago in April, we decided to invest in our first 10 companies, uh, which Scale Up Malaysia with our first cohort. And we just completed our second cohort where we've invested in another 11 companies. So in the last uh, two years or so, we've invested now, um, actually less than a year, we've invested now in 21 companies in Scale Malaysia. And as you mentioned in your introduction, Hilton, we are looking to do up to 50 companies by the end of next year. Uh, we think that Malaysian companies have huge potential. And we've seen this uh, in recent weeks, actually just in the last week, uh, you saw three interesting stories out of Malaysia with Aerodyne, which is one of the largest uh, drone companies in the world, number three, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. They serve 30 markets right now. Uh, there was also the story of um, Faith being acquired by Pine Labs and now being uh, you know, exported into India to grow their business there, which is also a really exciting story for Malaysia. And we have, of course, Grab, which you know uh, famously went to Singapore and, and called Singapore home. But I think what's important to remember is that those that's a Malaysian entrepreneur. It started in Malaysia way back when, and there's a huge opportunity there. So we think that there's a tremendous opportunity in grooming the next generation of Malaysian entrepreneurs. And you know, we think Malaysian entrepreneurs, as they grow, are able to grow regional business, if not global businesses, with the right kind of guidance. And so that's kind of the, the thesis behind Scale of Malaysia's identity. Uh, and we're really looking forward for what the future holds. Obviously, um, like William said, the last year has been especially challenging, especially for companies in our portfolio with a more consumer slant. Um, that's been a really challenging time for them, but we're really proud of the companies. Uh, overall, uh, the companies that we've invested in have managed to stay afloat, uh, keep revenues at a, at a reasonable clip. A lot of them actually have grown revenue over the last year, and we are really excited for the next year or so as they've kind of repositioned their business in the right way to kind of take 2020 and 2021 uh, in an aggressive way. Thank, Thank you. you. Charlie, um, talking to us from Shanghai. Um, I've been speaking to you over the yeah. last few weeks. You've been flying around very, very busy. Tell us a little right. bit more of, uh, in terms of your, your, your current plans and your, and, and your future objectives. Sure, yeah. Thank you very much, Hilton, for the introduction. And uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to have the chance to talk with uh, 
all the wonderful investors in the panel. Yeah, I've been in kind of actively investing in the blockchain technology project, mostly infrastructure project in the last uh, almost five years. Uh, has been an absolutely wonderful journey uh, in, in, in our space, in the crypto space. I, I, you know, I think one of the uh, interesting factor and the terms uh, we, we said a lot and uh, you go joke around is uh, the, the one day in crypto means a year outside of crypto. Like, especially in 2019, uh, two, since 2020, I think this kind of ratio become even bigger. Like every single day they have, you see so many interesting people entering the space. And we see sort of really solid innovation coming up. So I think in the last uh, three years, I've been busy and actively building ecosystem, building the bridge between especially European um, layer one infrastructure layer blockchain and solutions such as Polkadot, Cosmos into the, the Asian communities, especially in China. And we see the, the huge need and the demand that uh, a lot of developer communities in, in the Asian side, especially the top universities in China, in Japan, in you know, in, let's say Singapore as well, wants to get engaged with, uh, you know, the top level and you know, global Web3 ecosystem. You know, Ethereum has been quite successful in the last five years, building up their DeFi, you know, decentralized finance applications across the world. And I see a lot of actually new innovation coming up in the space, such as non-fungible token, uh, which we call NFT, but also digital asset tokenization in many, many areas. So in terms of what I do, in my fund, it's a very uh, kind of a novel approach. We try to be the bridge across different continents. And due to the fact crypto is very digital driven, right? And also blockchain is a, is a, is a, is a digital technology, you know, with uh, cryptology and some other technical solutions. We don't have to travel, um, you know, physically and to actually deliver things. Everything is actually open source driven. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm working with all those biggest uh, open source communities in China, including CSDN, uh, RustCC, uh, Python community, and so on. And uh, having great time working with all the smartest, uh, you know, engineers in China uh, has been a wonderful journey. Um, the, I think back to the topic today, right? How to scale up, you know, for for venture capital and also help entrepreneurs, you know, in the space. Uh, I think what I can tell from uh, the, the space of blockchain because I'm mostly and heavily focused on in this field, right? I see a lot of founders who have a very good global horizon, who can start their com company from day one in a global approach, can have a very interesting, net, uh, how to say, a narrative and a unique advantage to build up the community and start to scaling up that ecosystem in a fast way. Um, compared to the companies who actually want only focus on the local and just do their thing only. The ones who can who are able to you know scale up their global community in early stage and also reach out to a lot of partners um, in different countries, I think it's very helpful. That's actually one of the reasons we get to reach out to so many interesting, exciting projects who wants to actually come over and engage with the Asian communities, not just the technical communities, but also the investment community and also the, the finance community. One of the interesting part, I'm actually trying my best to help out a lot of founders, especially in the West, from the Western Western countries, is uh, the local content ad adoption and also the how to say the use case adoption. <coughs> what I was uh, doing a lot in the I think since 2020 was you know helping a lot of uh, infrastructure projects find interesting use cases. And in China, everybody knows we have a huge population. The mobile penetration is one of the highest in the world, right? We have so many people using mobile mobile based applications in Web 2.0 world, and we actually uh, quite easily get used to a lot of Web 3.0 applications, you know, built on top of blockchain, and some of them are doing with uh, cryptocurrency driven applications as well. And a lot of innovation come from, you know, especially from Europe, who have the vision to come over to Asia. We we need to help them to adjust a bit on the on their pitch and also the brand awareness and the, the use case adoption. So uh, I'm helping that for Polkadot, I'm helping that for Tezos, multiple, you know, layer one, quite big and well esta established uh, public chain infrastructure and to actually open up that channel and you know, building up the ecosystem in the Chinese uh, scope and has been quite busy, but also um, how to say fulfilled journey uh, since last year. And this year, I would say the booming innovation from the fact that Wall Street is actually entering the space of crypto. You know, we have great scale, a lot of big funds, mm -hmm. you know, traditional main street fintech companies entering the space. It has been um, 
another level of you know interesting growth in the space. So I'm very excited to um, actually explore what's next, right? For to, to to you know investors and you know accelerators like us to be, close the dots, uh, connect the dots, close the bridge, right? To help uh, accelerate innovation from different countries together. Thank you. That's really exciting. John, you sitting in in Singapore and give a little bit uh, your current experiences and opportunities that you see going forward from Singapore. You are mute. John. <laughs> there we are. R rookie mistake. Um, so, so yeah, we, um, uh, we're a global company, actually. We're based in Singapore because I was living here. I started um, Hatchel One here in Singapore, which was like a very traditional uh, micro fund, $20 million. We ideated 13 companies, did 20 investments in total. Um, I found the whole experience. So that's ended well, or, or it's on its way to ending well. We're in year seven now. We're sitting with a 22% IRR, 2x return. So eventually we'll do 28%, um, 3x return on that, uh, on that fund. Um, it was very hard work, actually, because um, we did a lot of ideation and then we had to sort of make the companies work from conception all the way through to you know, public listing in the case of, of two of them. And uh, so learned a lot from that experience and also learned that I really didn't like a lot about what I was seeing in venture capital and in the acceleration environment, um, uh, with the exception of modern accelerators that had really adopted and people like SOSV that had adopted, uh, spent a lot of time looking at uh, Y Combinator and sort of more modern approaches to running accelerators and, and that kind of process. Um, so at the end of our investment period, I was very interested to, uh, the whole time I was running the first fund, I felt like I was actually running a casino, but I was running around putting, putting bets on tables based on the attractiveness of the croupier rather than, than, than um, hard data and, and solid process. And so I was quite interested at the end of the first fund to understand exactly what the odds were in venture and in understanding the odds, come up with a portfolio strategy or an, an ecosystem development strategy that would be able to embrace those odds and create more predictable returns. And I was quite fascinated in the early stages of venture because there's a, quite a lot of data available from Pitchfork and CB Insights and Crunchbase and what have you on the later stage of ventures, but the places where we all play, where the four of us play, um, is very early stage and data is really quite um, hard to get on early stage companies. Um, and so what we wanted to do is come up with better ways to gather the data um, and better ways to shape that data into a portfolio or into a decision-making matrix. So what we've spent a lot of time on and about 10 million bucks on in the last three years is, is creating a, a database of about 600,000 venture events um, a network that now stretches out to about 200 um, groups that are using our platform around the world. And they feed us about uh, 30,000 deals a year. And that gives us a lot more data because all these deals that are at an accelerator stage, we partner with accelerators. So it's a similar model to Williams um, in the sense that we have a number of accelerators that are feeding us information. What we're trying to do with that information is figure out how to construct a portfolio whereby we can invest using a standardized kind of selection ratio, um, standardized processes around deal terms um, and follow on investment um, quantums and things like that. So we're, we're kind of taking it, well, we are taking a data driven approach, but we're more of a sort of fintech looking to disrupt venture capital than we are a pure sort of venture capital play. We're kind of coming at it the side and we see a massive gap. Gardner came out last week and said, uh, said 75% of VCs are going to be using AI in, in 2025. And we thought to ourselves, well, the, most VCs are spending $50,000 a year on tech and data. Um, we're spending $3 million a year on tech and data. So maybe we can drive a wedge into that gap and, and, and play a role within the community. So our platform is free. Anyone can use it. Anyone can use our APIs. Anyone can get and bounce off our API infrastructure and get back scoring and do a decent job of pulling together data, et cetera. So what we're trying to do is play a useful role within the ecosystem, work with all our partners at the accelerators, do co-investment, and overall try and do what we can to help improve, improve process and understanding at the early stages. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. I mean, data is a very, very important uh, aspect for looking at the opportunity. I mean, just pre-COVID in 2019, the global startup economy was worth around three, three trillion. 
Um, it's risen um, from the previous years, uh, previous two years by 20 percent. And, this, and if you look at the size of that, it's it's not so small an economy. I mean, it's larger than the GDP of the UK or France or Brazil. And technology-driven startups aren't just contributing to economic growth. In many ways, they are the economic growth. Um, a question to all of you uh, is, how much is this due to the role and contribution played by scale-ups, startups, and accelerators and venture capitalists? All of it. Go to, yeah, go John, please. That's a, I was just that's being glib, but, but I, I just said all of it. But I, I'm, I'm only half joking because without us, um, businesses don't get started, right? With accelerators, I think we're now approaching a situation where 60% of Series A companies have been through an accelerator in some form. Um, mm -hmm. So without accelerators, you, you don't get to that next level of funding and that next level of, of support. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, for us, it comes down to... Um, you know, it's hard to do things alone, right? So uh, when you're starting up, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's very difficult. Uh, so if you can do it within a framework uh, where you're getting help from other people, uh, it gives you a leg up. Uh, and so, um, you know, you do not have to go through an accelerator program to be successful. Um, but uh, especially for those who are maybe in their first or second company, um, you know, it, it does help a lot. Now, our, our, we try and be we try and differentiate ourselves from other programs, uh, in that uh, we bring a platform and we help with sales and customer acquisition, enterprises sales and, and customer acquisition. So we actually partner with 120 other accelerators uh, who feed us companies that we can help scale up. So we're we're less on the incubator earlier stage side; we're more on the scale up side. Um, but it's an ecosystem of, of uh, investors and, and operators who come together uh, to help the startups uh, get to where they're going. Because uh, uh, it's just it's a lot easier to do it within the context of a community uh, than to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Aaron? Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree as well. I think like the accelerator model is something that a lot of companies can benefit from and have benefited from simply because it provides, a, as William was saying, a framework for them to be successful. And, and where we operate is in Scale Up Malaysia is we work with companies who already have some revenue, they already have customers, they have a product in market, and the challenge that they have is how do I get from here A to B to get to the next stage of growth? And that's where a lot of guys flounder because most entrepreneurs, when we start a business, we start it because we love the product we're in, we love serving the customer, and the thing that we lack is maybe an understanding of the ecosystem, who the players are, how do we talk to an investor, and this is, I think, where uh, accelerators can really help uh, these companies kind of refine their presentations, ref refine the businesses and the pitches to get to that stage where they can raise for long capital. Because ultimately, uh, capital is needed in the startup space to get these companies to grow. Uh, most startups, by definition, operate on business models that maybe have not existed before or have not been tried before. So there's an element of, of market risk with these companies. And so... That's where venture capital comes into play because they're taking bets on these companies that they could theoretically build a future with the solution they're coming with and what they're bringing to the market. Uh, very different than if you decide to start a restaurant, for example, where the playbook is kind of clear, right? Uh, a, a typical startup is doing something that's never been done before. And so accelerators help refine it. The capital is important to kind of propel it. And I think all these things play in like a, a string of events that every startup needs to go through to get them to that stage. Mm -hmm. Charlie? Yeah, I think to uh, um, everybody just mentioned a lot of interesting points. Uh, I want just to add up one thing. Then um, I think a lot of, especially this year, you know, especially in my fields, like capital is actually one of the how does the easiest access to the field, especially the, the, for the project for the capital who just write a check and don't really provide post investment value. I think I've been sitting on like advisory board, you know, advising multiple um, projects for you know for a while and. Um, Actually, having helping them managing the cap table and so on, you know, the more I helping them, the more I realize, especially in this field right now, when we consider it's a bull market in our space, um, just have a capital on, on, you know, putting a you know fund's name and a logo on the website isn't really the value, you know, entrepreneurs and founders should look for, right? It's really about you know what exactly is the help you can get from the the the, the, the not what well, not I don't want to call it VC actually, it's also accelerator or maybe you know, whoever support you, right, backer. So the reason we call it Accelerator is speed in many interesting technology field 
is very essential piece, right? You need to make sure you can you find the really interesting way to effect, effectively and efficiently push your solution or product to the right target audience, right? And you kind of need to scale that the growth marketing and also really take and you know seize, seize up your market share in a very efficient manner, right? So acceleration or venture builder or let's say ecosystem supporter is definitely helpful, especially in the digital field. Physical space or physical distance is actually not the issue. Literally, people from a very exotic place who came up with an interesting idea have an interesting code base. They can start the open source community and open source project and start fundraising. You know, especially in the blockchain field, is actually happening a lot. Everything can be done in the very very short period, like a couple months from zero to one, one to ten. Like as long as you have interesting narrative, interesting solution, you are solving the right problems, right? And the fact that we have so many interesting accelerators all over the world, the geographic location distance is not an issue right now. We have mm -hmm. so many added people who not just write a check, right, and also provide very important advice and other resources to, to help the you know the, the project and speed up, right? So we've been writing a lot of checks in the last uh, let's say six months. We 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 made almost uh, sixty investments in different projects. Some of them we get a very little allocation in the early rounds because uh, a lot of projects actually don't want to raise too much. They realize they want to actually have a higher return on investment. That the the the, the valuation is actually much smaller than they used to be. And then in order to get the also, also in early round investment allocation, the things the 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 founders are always looking for is so besides this you know logo and the the check you write for us, right? Uh, appreciate that. But what else you can help you know on the, what kind of value you can bring on the table? I think that's actually on the founder side, it's always looking for the value, right? The value added investor. So I think venture builder or accelerator, exactly one of the term in, to summarize, you know, to help the, the, the project to, of course, load on the risk of, of failure, but also speed up the process of growth. And we're talking about growth marketing here. We're talking about user acquisition here. We're talking about fundraising here, right? But also we see a lot of projects have some bottleneck to really push out to the next stage, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about Series A to Series B. A lot of companies sitting on Series A for multiple years, right? They they can't get the Series B. A lot of projects just sitting on Series B forever. They they cannot really reach out to the IPO or whatnot, right? In crypto, although we have a relatively shortcut on the because of the listing on there, you know, so on. Still, a lot of projects cannot really push their project to list get listed on major exchanges, right? So they still need a lot of help from different areas and so on. So I think. Having helped a lot of projects in the in the recent months, scaling up is definitely needed for every single project, and they need help from different angles, right? And uh, what just, William just said as well, you know, no matter how how Superman they are, the founder are, they need they they, need, they still need help from th different angles from different people, right? By having the right partner to work with, those kind of help will be valuable uh, for them and um, for their success. Yeah. yeah. I mean, thank you for that. I mean, it, this is, I mean, this speaks a little bit of personal experience, as you know, that, you know, um, Studium Group and um, Open Business Council, Cities ABC, you know, we, you know, we've been building out our ecosystems, etc. And we've been approached by investors. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult choice to make is which investors to actually work with, because, you you know, what are their, what, apart from their checkbook, what are they bringing to the table as partners? What are the strategic role that they're going to pay, uh, play in this this whole process? So, I mean, if you can give it, I'm going to throw this question out to all of you. I mean, what do you bring to the table to really, really help scale these these these, these startups? Yeah, just um, so I, I talked a little bit about what Mox does. You know, free advertising, uh, and mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it, I literally, I went to four years just knocking on doors saying, "Hey, you're going to get killed by big internet. And give us free advertising." And everybody told me to get lost. Um, they were some of them were not that polite. Uh, but uh, uh, and then you know, things started to break up. You know, LG just left the smartphone market. Right, they just shut down. You know, four or five years ago, nobody thought that LG would shut down. Samsung, everybody's talking about them getting out of the smartphone market. So we're pre-installed in every Samsung in India. We're pre-installed in every Xiaomi in India. That's 56% market share. And it's because, um, you know, the, the, these large companies are under pressure. They're willing to try some new things. On the enterprise side, it's all about trying new things. So, you know, I'm based in Shanghai normally. Uh, I'm traveling now, as I told uh, Charlie, but uh, we're usually in the same city. Um, and what we do on the enterprise side uh, is we 
help uh, companies from around the world sell to Asia, sell to large corporate. Now, the funny thing is everybody thinks, oh, go to the number two economy in the world, go to China and sell to Chinese corporates. Uh, if anybody has ever actually tried to sell to a Chinese corporate, you would understand that it's not like the easiest thing in the world. Um, and we learned that the hard way. Like you were 11 years in on China Accelerator. Um, and so we, we actually, basically, we stopped trying a long time ago. What we learned, though, uh, is that the multinationals, the Fortune 1000, are getting their asses kicked by the local Chinese uh, companies. The local players have more money. They move faster. They're generally, um, you could say, uh, att attract better talent. Uh, and uh, so uh, they're really desperate because, you know, these global players cannot not be in the number two economy in the world uh, and, and maybe on that many levels, levels seem to be number one. So what we do is we bring companies from around the world, including China, and we help them sell to large multinationals in China. So the weirdest thing is where you have an American or European startup come to China to sell to an American or European corporate. Uh, but, I mean, we just signed uh, Pfizer as a, a partner last week. Uh, and normally, you know, the guy was telling me, hey, you know, normally for a program like this where we're doing uh, paid POCs and pilots, uh, it would, from first conversation, it would take a year uh, to get to uh, a signature. Uh, for us, first conversation in China, three months uh, and they prepaid uh, and everything, you know, we're launching the program next week. Uh, or this week. So um, you know, this was last week when we signed it. Uh, so that's sort of, uh, you know, China speed, like Charlie was talking about earlier. Uh, things are on China speed and the large multinationals, if they're not doing China speed in China, they're, they're, they're cooked. Uh, so we're taking advantage of that to build that bridge um, between startups from around the world and multinationals. But we call it the China backdoor. Uh, because once you're in China and large multinationals, then we sell to the, you know, the rest of the world within that corporate, we try and penetrate out. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I mean, Aaron, for your own, for your experience in, in in Malaysia, Malaysia is a very very digital world, and there are lots of startups in 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 Malaysia. I mean, what the, what is the challenge from the perspective that William was speaking about in terms of getting access to to that marketplace? So I think for Malaysia, you're right. We've had a lot of activity in the startup space over the last um, two decades or so. Right, the government itself has made a decision in the late 90s to start investing in the tech space uh, through the uh, multimedia super corridor and eventually with uh, things that MDEC is doing as well as you know, the other agencies like Cradle and Magic and these guys are playing in the space to help develop the technology ecosystem. Um, and, and we do have a lot of interesting companies that have started, have done a decent job. And um, But one thing that we've realized is a challenge in Malaysia is that we are kind of a in a weird Goldilocks zone because we're, we're way bigger than, than Singapore, but we're smaller than Indonesia. So Malaysian founders actually can build a decent sized company in Malaysia, but that also makes them not feel like they need to go out of Malaysia and like become a regional business or become that large company. So they, a lot of them become really, really comfortable uh, as just Malaysian place, right? And so I think one of the things that we are doing at Scale of Malaysia is we want to see how we can help more of these companies get out of the Malaysian bubble and get into Indonesia, into Thailand, into Vietnam, and uh, eventually to places like China and, and, and Europe, right? Because we feel like a Malaysian company that can be successful in Malaysia has a high chance of being successful in another market because we're so multicultural, we're such a like, a like a melting pot of culture here in Malaysia. You could build that story and you can build that digital plane. Uh, at scale up, one thing that we emphasize a lot is we're pretty high touch. Uh, and that comes from the fact that a lot of us are, are founders or uh, entrepreneurs ourselves, we kind of understand the pain points. And so we kind of tell our companies that we're kind of like your sounding board or you, we are your invisible or, or external management team. And a lot of our companies really enjoy this because they see us as a place they can bounce ideas off of. And uh, we kind of go into the weeds with them. Sometimes we go through like deep forecasting with them so that they can see that we add that value into their journey as well. And we build that relationship with these founders as they grow. So we, we find that for us, very fulfilling because we're able to kind of not really handhold, but be a partner or like in the passenger seat of that journey. And I think the companies also seem to be enjoying the fact that they've got us in their corner, rooting for them and supporting them at the same time. For the second call, we felt that there was a need to not just do that, but add a regional component, which is why we partnered with a regional VC uh, in Quest Ventures to kind of do the second call. Uh, and we felt that there was an importance for us to kind of build that bridge from 
being a successful Malaysian company to building a, becoming a regional, if not global company. That's kind of the value add we saw in that initiative. So now we're, we're growing that further um, with the, some of the initiatives the government has rolled out with our partners uh, in the VCs that we've attracted to the program as well. Uh, and also uh, with the, the core program itself, where we're doing this uh, three to four month training, plus we invest in the companies as well. So we think um, this kind of high touch with kind of market access approach uh, has been quite successful for us so far. And we think this will create evidence in time. Thank you. I mean, John, from your perspective, being a global platform, which is very technology driven, um, the touch points is, as, as, as Arab was talking about, what level of engagement do you give to the to your the startups that are on the platform in terms of uh, apart from the, the 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 access to data and information what's that relationship like um so one of the problems that we're trying to solve is is um is if you're a brand new founder you're maybe 25 years old you're fresh out of university you've been had this idea bouncing around your head for a couple of years where's the best place to take that idea and, and so we've diligenced about 400 accelerators to try. There's about 9,000 accelerators in, in the world. There's about 400 that get good deal flow. So we've diligenced those guys and tried to figure out where do you, where do you push Startup ABC? So Startup ABC is a medical device startup um, that, and they want to work on a patent. Where's the best accelerator in the world that they could go to? I can tell you off the top of my head, it's probably zero to five, ten um, is, would, would be the place that I would send them to. But but that's me talking directly to a founder. How do we take that and scale that up um, as an approach? So what we're testing at the moment is, a, is an AI-driven mandate matching capability where a, a founder can come into our site. They can basically enter, they can create a data profile and go through our application process. And at the end of that, we can make several recommendations um, where they can go to. Now, there's only 20 accelerators that we, um, uh, uh, we co-invest with. They're not quite as big as, as Williams um, uh, Group. Um, but we wouldn't necessarily send them to the guys that we can invest with. We would send them to the place we think is the best match and maybe provide two or three um, places that would be backup choices for them. And the way that we do it now is we say this is a 69% match, this is a 64% match, this is a 51% match down the list. Now, what's great about that is founders typically know three or four people they can go to for advice. Those three or four people may not know the best place to send them for um the capital or for support, the kind of support these these guys, uh, these other guys in the call are going to give them. So what we want to do is find the best home for those guys because we think that's the best service that we can provide a founder at the point at which they 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 are looking for that need. So we're looking for people that have a proven history of providing that support and that success um, and scale up capability, and then we want to do that the, the match up with those with those guys with the founder and the the correct accelerator or venture studio. Yes. I mean, one of the challenges that I'm familiar with is when, you know, talking to lots of accelerators, um, you know, everybody thinks of all the big, you know, the big names out there, the white combinators, and et cetera. Um, and there's, some, you know, there's a whole a plethora of other. And the business model, as I see it, for some of these is that, you know, you go through a, an application process, you use F6X or, or, or whatever. You then get to a process of, you know, um, they talking to you, you, you go online and they have these introductory um, uh, meetings uh, with loads of potential people who want to come on board. And then you get down to the bottom line and they say, well, you pay us X amount and we will, on the, we will take you through this program because we've got a great lineup of, say, you know, uh, investors that we would like to introduce you to. You know, we really want to reshape your offering. I mean, it's great advice, et cetera, et cetera. You, it's, it's basically a pay-to-play process. Whether they take equity or not, we don't, you know, that's... I, that's don't, I don't think anyone that I know in this business that, that's working at a professional or a high level is, is doing anything pay-to-play. Like, we do that service I just mentioned for completely for free. And when you're looking for anything out of that, you know, maybe we'll get co-investment if it goes to one of our partners. Terrific. It's an opportunity that we get. It's not something that we're necessarily paying for other than investing in the tech to, to get us there. But, but I think the old pay-to-play model of you know, paying for access, I, I, I just I, I fundamentally don't like that approach. You know, I don't imagine any of the other guys on the call. Um, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, when you say pay-to-play, it's like uh, we do charge equity for our program. Um, of course. So Equity's the, fine. Uh, no, I know what you're talking about. But like, so 
It is to some extent. I mean, we do invest cash too, but we're, you know, and, and we're not a puppy farm like uh, YC or some of these others where they're doing 300 a batch. Um, so the, uh, well, anyway, uh, so, uh, uh, so the, the idea though is that, um, you know, people need to get value for their equity, right? So they're paying their equity, which is actually worth something. Uh, and hopefully it'll be worth a lot more um, as the program. So it's like, okay, uh, you know, we, we generally take about the average of 5%, it's 4 to 6% common for the program, and then we invest our cash. So basically if you take a little bot, you know, a little, little square, a little circle or whatever, and then it's like, you're this big right now, give or take. And then what happens if we can like, you know, make you this big, yeah. And okay, we're gonna take a little five percent sliver here, uh, but if you look at the the size that you grew, and on average, um, you know our internal goal is to help our companies grow their net revenue by three x, right? Which um, uh, we're actually doing better, but a lot of our companies are starting off with a small base. They're you know they're, on average, our companies are doing about thirty k monthly net revenue before they come in, and on average, we three x it to you know on average it's around 90 ish by the time they come out within the, the, the goal is in the next three to six months, but, you know, try and try and get that three X. Um, so the idea is to grow the pie and then, yeah, we're going to take a little cut. Yeah. I think what we're talking about pay to play was like pay to access. Right? No, I know. We, we, yeah, like yeah. The old Carrots U4 well, model well, and uh, yeah, the, the uh, what's that other, the, 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 the guy who bought, uh, um, God, red herring. Yeah, that, yeah, not, not, not big fans. You know the smart founders when you're red herring nominated. You know the dumb foreigner. Uh, you know the, the the dumb startup guys when it's like uh, when you actually won it. Yeah, because <laughs> you have to pay to win. <laughs> you're exactly. nominated is okay, but if you actually win, it means you pay the money. Yeah. So, so to be clear, we, we have exactly the same model, but we're all cash, right? Because we don't do what you guys do. We don't run programs. We don't. We, we you know, that's not what we do. So we'll typically take a five percent stake for a similar a similar cash level of, of equity investment, and I think five percent is pretty typical, right, William and Charlie? That's what you would you would see. Well, I think uh, uh, if I was stepping on the numbers, um, because I'm, we, our space is so decentralized in a way, five percent is actually quite a lot. Um, in a way, it's kind of feel like an ownership type of thing. Um, normally, we take even less than three percent. Because we really want to scale up the, the project in a, in a global level in different countries, right? So our model, the, the, the value added thing we normally do is really on the advisory role and the strategy role, right? On, on, the, on the side, you know, a lot of founders, especially who are new in the, in the crypto space, who really need to kind of have somehow from A to Z type of hand, hand holding, you know, guide, uh, gu guidelines, right? So I think that the, the fact that a lot of... Uh, Founders having great experience working with us, not just you know receiving our investment, is really we have been through this journey from A to Z multiple times, right? We have been through failures. We see a lot of projects did well, did not well, right? We go through this bearish market and bullish market because we're in this crypto space multiple years. So for the people who are kind of new to the space, who are not really get used to, to the cycle, to the ups and downs on volatility, and also there's a lot of whole bunch of new people and new partners they need to meet. Right, they are new people. How to trust them? Right, are they real people? Are they really legit? Can they trust them and so on? It's it, it will be very difficult for new founders who are new to the space to choose the right partner to work with. And the opportunity yeah. cost, especially in this in this active kind of crazy uh, bull run time right now, it's to the roof. Right, this, the opportunity cost is huge. If you 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 choose the wrong partner to work with. And uh, some product even get killed. Literally, you know, yeah. it goes to dead deadline, you know, a dead dead end, right? So I think one of the essential value we try to play and also make sure our investment is safe and get a high return is uh, we I'm not saying we, we try to control the project, but we really want to step yeah. in and check in once we see they probably will have some kind of risky, you know, how to say crossroads, right? To make sure they go to the right direction and to make sure they have some unknown unknown. We need to let them know. If you choose this one, did you realize you have this downside and so on and so forth, right? I think for us playing this kind of venture builder advisory role, not just you know writing a check, is very helpful for us to make sure our investment is is is, is higher. Uh, is to be honest, in the last six months, the investment return in crypto is actually to the roof. Um, some of the project actually get the almost 100x. You know, not just because the market is so well, but because the team is good, 
but also they write they choose the right partner to work with in different mm -hmm. geographic location in different stages you know every single stages you know project is a like different life cycle right you have very early stage with just a deck not even with uh, like revenue yet and then all the way to like almost tens of thousand community users you know who are paid users and so on right they have a lot of influencers a lot of media already writing kind of press reads about your project and also get list on major exchanges and so on right have huge liquidity tlv and all that right so different stages have different hurdles different challenges right i do not think the founders who have been through the whole journey as they're kind of new to the space can tackle every single stuff perfectly right so that's really the issue like we need to make sure that the founders know what they're doing if we kind of check in and they, they kind of have no like no understanding and so on and we we have to kind of validate that and kind of make sure hey you, you need to make sure you have this ready and that you know you did you realize you need to get the security check on your code you know things like that right yeah. so yeah. the the our how to say the pie you know when i'm talking about the pie right the 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 the, the percentage of the pie or token we we normally try to get is much smaller than normal how to say the uh, normal equity and, and deal uh, because uh, we want to make sure it's more decentralized um, so to be honest, like Y Combinator or some other accelerator I used to actually get involved 10 years ago was like at least the 15% or something right off the bat. Like I, if, looking back right yeah. now, I think it's actually really, really huge. Um, yeah. because yeah, YC right now is about 10%, uh, because yeah. wow. they're yeah. doing a post, uh, they're going to post money safe. So they have anti dilution and everybody below them and everybody after them. But Charlie, are yeah. you talking about, uh, you're taking 3% of the entire project or three, because what we do, just to clarify, uh, crypto projects and, and, and traditional equity a little bit different. So oh, yeah. we were generally taking um, five percent of the company uh, for a traditional equity. Uh, but when we do um, any of the crypto projects, we're actually just taking five percent of what the team gets. Um, so we're not taking five percent of the entire project. We're taking usually the team might take ten percent of these decentralized projects. Right, right. Right. So like uh, five percent of the ten percent is actually zero point five percent. Uh, so we're trying to uh, make it so that, you know, everything's balanced. If the team makes money, we make money. If the team doesn't make money, we don't make money. Yeah. Uh, and we try not to be too greedy on this one because early stage is generally like zero and the one, right? And so uh, it's going to work or not. Yeah. But I think one thing that's important is, is the founders listening to, the, to us talk here is, is to understand that not all accelerators are providing, um, some are just providing a, a place to sit and advise them and a very small amount of capital. Um, but I think the better places to are providing both, right? Yeah, they're providing yeah. the process, they're providing the people with the experience to help them, and they're also providing capital. So where we fill a, a role sometimes is we find ourselves working with a great bunch of guys, maybe a research group attached to some university in America that has a lot of capability but doesn't have a lot of capital because they may be investing in a balance sheet or something else. So what we do is we turn up and we say, we'll give you $50,000 for each of those startups so that you can put some capital in their hand and you can then work your experience and work your magic for the rest of the program. So I think it's a good, I think there's ways that you can sort of bridge those gaps, right? It may not be capital or it may, well, it's harder to bridge the no experience gap. You've got to have a program. You've got to have some good people yeah. run. Yeah. Now, I think, like, you know, for, for the, those who are watching, I saw a question pop up just now as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are in the business of paying it forward. You know, and, and what every accelerator wants to do is add value to the company early in the, in the business. If, if you see somebody come and offer you and say, you can join our program if, if you pay us, uh, that's something you maybe want to, you know, think twice about. Because there are other great programs out there that, you know, uh, who don't do that. And we want to invest in you and add value in the business before, without, without taking anything out of it. Um, I, I think it's really important that founders realize that, that it's all about that. And what they should do is talk to companies who have been part of these accelerator programs before. They'll tell you everything you need to know about whether or not these programs are right for you and their experience there. Actually, the best yeah, example is publish their metrics right, right on the website. You can see yeah, what their follow-on rates are, yeah, what the success rates are, what the selection rates are. So, so you can see a lot of this. You can find out mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff online. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the challenge, the challenge for, you know, if, you, if I put my, you know, I'm a, a, an entrepreneur and I've got a, 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 um, a business um, and then I have investors coming on board, how do I protect them against, um, you, know, you know, I'm going to need more capital as I grow. Growth capital is very, very important. And I need to go through various rounds of funding 
but there's going to be a dilution effect. How would you advise um, both both sides effectively to to do that, to protect themselves in terms of um, anti-dilution going forward? Yeah, so I mean, that's the um, advice we have to give every day. So three things, so just really quickly, because we're running out of time. First one is, um, you know, it, usually it's a step-by-step uh, fundraising, especially in Asia, right? And so um, you try not to get diluted. You know, your goal is to only get, you know, about 15% dilution each step. There will be multiple steps. Try and have, um, you know, half of, hopefully your goal is to, when you hit Series A, after the Series A, the founders and the team, you know, Founders Plus ESOP is still over 50%, hopefully. Uh, and so in order to actually make that work, you need to have traction, then fundraising, uh, as opposed to, you know, markets like the U.S. where you have fundraising, then traction. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, so it, it's just, uh, you know, try and get to product market fit uh, before you start spending money if possible. You just absolutely nailed it. That's the essential difference between the two ecosystems, William. Is, is the funding then go out and perform? Because what I see a lot of happening here in Singapore is kind of uncle funding, I call it, where they'll give you $500,000, you get like <laughs> That's right. something, and then, and then they come and they give you another 500000 at the exact same valuation. That doesn't help anybody, that kind of funding. And so the funding, then traction, wonderfully said, because that's the difference, I think, between, between the developing ecosystem and, and, the, and, and a system like the US. Do you find that's the same in China, by the way? Or is it shifting? Uh, depends on who you are. I mean, Charlie can speak to it as well. But uh, for, I mean, we're not investing in too many local, local entrepreneurs, but there's a spectrum in local, local entrepreneurs. And so the people who've got the background, uh, they've got the pedigree, uh, they came out of a big company or they're a serial entrepreneur, their initial rounds are actually self-funded. They're just starting their companies up themselves um, and friends and family. So they can probably generally raise like one, two, three million US just by passing the hat around. And then the first institutional VC round is like a four to eight million dollar round. Um, then there's the people who don't have that background, don't have that pedigree, uh, and, it, and it gets a bit more difficult. Uh, and so usually there is funding there, but um, you know, you're, you're going into the weeds. Uh, there's like a lot of government backed funds that are kind of called incubators. Uh, and, um, you know, most of the companies out of those things die, but you know, so it, it gets difficult. So there, I mean, it's just like any other market, you know, there's, there's the top of the pyramid and then there's the bottom. Um, and, uh, so the, you know, yeah, I'll just stop there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, gentlemen, you know, we've got three minutes and I'd like to give you all an opportunity to to really um, give the audience a chance to engage with you. If you could just to do a quick round robin of a minute each where we can focus on um, the um, the, you know, where, 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 where can where can they, where can they find you? How do they engage and uh, and, uh, and 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 what can you, you can help them with? I yeah, can cool, do just quickly. Then, uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I can do mine in 20 seconds. Hatcher.com. Um, you can apply through Hatcher.com and then go to one of our accelerator partners. Um, you can learn a lot go, by going on any of the blogs of any of these uh, these these fine gentlemen that we're on the call with here. Um, I would just stress to, to all the founders listening, just to explore as many options as you can, talk to other founders, find out what worked for them, uh, and then follow their direction, because that's usually pretty good advice. Thank yeah, you. so really quickly, applications are always open at uh, Mox, MobileOnlyX.com, and ChinaAccelerator.com. I, I, the best way, though, is just we have about 470 mentors, um, and uh, we work with them. They might not be the most famous people in the world, but they've failed at many things and succeeded at at least one. Uh, so find one of those uh, people that uh, you might uh, have a, a connection to and, and get a referral in that usually cuts through uh, some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the fog or whatever. Thanks. Cool. And, and you can find us on scaleup.my. We are currently opening our third cohort. Uh, we should announce that in May, and we'll, we'll bring companies into the program and help you guys grow and scale. So if you're in Malaysia, you're looking for opportunities, come to scaleup.my or follow us on social media where we're always posting stuff and doing different things. So uh, we'll catch you guys around. Thank you. Charlie. Yeah, on my side, Carbon Blue is our um, venture and innovation website. You can find all the information about us. The easiest way to reach out to me is on LinkedIn. Uh, always on LinkedIn to building the bridges with all the international partners. 
And uh, if you need any help, on, especially on the China ecosystem, on the crypto scenes, all kinds of stakeholders, exchanges, communities, and our interesting, you know, crypto funds, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. And I think the experience I'm having in this space can be helpful. Fantastic. Gentlemen, this has been very enlightening. We didn't get through all the questions because your experience and knowledge was so much more important. And I hopefully that you've, you, you've, you've learned something from each other. I've certainly learned a, a load from you all. I would encourage us all to continue engaging with each other. We'll be happy to share um, any, 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 anybody that comes to us to you for, um, for your advice. Thank you, John. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Charlie. And thank you, William, for your thank great you. contribution. Yeah. In your time. Thank really you. Thanks, Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. See you guys.